So this is uh, week three um, of a series that we're calling Whistle While You Wait, and we're landing the plane today. Um, but this is re- really, we've just been walking through the life of a man named Joseph. Joseph is uh, really, his story makes up a large portion of the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. And so it, it covers a lot of ground. And so there's a lot of narrative. It's one of the, you know, one of the, one of the few really very narrative, you know, lengthy stories in scripture. And so there's a lot in there, but there's a theme that kind of runs throughout his life. We jump into the story when he's 17. And now when we're kind of landing the plane today, he's, he's around 40 years old. And so it's this kind of long span of time and we really get a lot of details. And, um, but, but here's what, Here's the question that we're kind of driving through his, his story is this. It's what are you waiting for? And it's because um, throughout our lives and in Joseph's life as well, um, there are just always seasons of, of waiting. And sometimes there's circumstances that are really good and sometimes circumstances that are really bad. But the truth is we don't really know how everything's going to turn out. And so it's like we're in this season of like, what's coming next? What's waiting? What are we waiting for? And and we read that question and we're thinking, well, I'm waiting on things to get better. I'm waiting on things to improve. I need things to sort of work out and pan out. And, and then I'll know what to do next. Then I'll, I'll, I'll be able to figure it out. And the truth is, as Christians, we should be able to have a different perspective. And that's really what we've been trying to contrast this with in this series. We should be able to ask this a different way. We should be able to ask as Christians, as those who really believe that God is always with us, in the good and the bad, we should be able to say, if God is with me, even in the waiting, then what am I waiting for? In other words, not just what am I waiting for, what I need something to happen, but what am I waiting for because God's with me? Why am I waiting on things to improve or to get better? Why do I need things to, to look different? What am I waiting for? And, and so we've been looking at Joseph's life because what you, what you discover is that if, if, if you and I could drive this uh, drive our, our perspective through this filter, the filter of this question, we would see things a lot differently. We would begin to see that, that maybe our circumstances don't have to actually pan out and work out for us to realize, hey, God is still with me. God is still with me. And how, do we, how should I respond knowing and believing and being confident that that is true? And when you look at Joseph's life, here's what's so amazing, is that no matter how bad things get for you, Joseph's circumstances were worse. No matter how good things maybe turn out and work out for you, Joseph's circumstances ended up being a whole lot better. He experienced some amazing things. And yet, here's what's great, is that, and and a little comforting, somehow nothing ever changed about how he responded to life's circumstances. And, And here's the thing, he was a young man when all of this started, when he was sold into slavery. He was 17 years old, and yet he didn't have miracles happening all around him. He didn't have a Bible to read. He didn't have a, he didn't have a small group of encouraging friends. He didn't have a church family. He didn't have you know, God speaking to him in the clouds audibly. I mean, and yet he continued to respond, even when things were at their absolute worst, he continued to respond as somebody would, who was confident, that God is with them. And so for those of you who maybe you're just jumping in, maybe you're online, maybe you're watching later, maybe you're here for the first time, whatever it is, I just want to make sure that we're all up to speed because again, I'm going to tell some of this story, but then I'll, I'll read a little bit and we'll kind of you know mix that in a little bit. But I, I want to try to go through this fairly quickly while, while not missing the, the, the point of today. And so To get us all up to speed, he was 17, Joseph was 17 years old, when his brothers chose not to kill him, even though they had plotted to. Instead, they they showed him a little mercy, and they decided to just sell him into slavery to some Ishmaelite traders who were on their way to Egypt to, to, to hawk some things. And so Joseph becomes one of these. He finds himself a slave in or a servant in Potiphar's house, who was one of the kind of higher ups in in Egyptians, um, in, in the Egyptian government, he was one of the uh, captain of the guard, is who he was, and so um, he finds himself there. But then it's not too long, and, and he ends up being imprisoned for something that he, he was accused uh, of something he didn't do. And then, sure enough, he was found guilty, and he got thrown into prison. So now he's an imprisoned slave. I mean, his situation couldn't have been much worse. But here's what you read all throughout. You see this phrase in this story. 
and the Lord was with him. And we read that, and again, if you've never read through this story, if you read through it for the very first time with fresh eyes, and like, you don't, hey, I don't know how the story ends, and you get to these points, and you're like, and the Lord was with him. And you and I would, our, our knee-jerk reaction would be to say, no, he wasn't. That, that's false, wrong, can't be happening, can't be true, because you know what? If God was with him, if the Lord was with him, if the Lord was with Joseph, then good things will be happening to him, because after all, good things happen to good people, right? And that's kind of our theology. That's the way we think of things. And, and yet, this is the phrase that we get. He responds differently, even at the bottom, even when he doesn't know how things are going to work out, because Joseph believed something different. Joseph honestly believed that God was really with him in spite of all of that. And so he finds himself there. But then, as we saw last week, things began to turn around. And he actually becomes, he goes from like an imprisoned slave to like the number two guy in all of Egypt. It was pretty unbelievable because he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. And some, for, for some reason, the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he bought it. You know, it's like, okay, I, I believe you. That must be what this is. And he tells him, Joseph tells him, look, so there's going to be seven years of great abundance, wonderful things. It's going to be, there's just going to be an, an influx of you know, all kinds of supplies and resources and food, and it's going to be fantastic. But then there's, it's going to be followed by seven years of nothing, of famine. And so here's what I think you should do. He goes on to tell him, here's what I think you should do, Pharaoh. You need to put some people in charge who are going to do a great job, some really organized leaders who are going to do a great job of... of Saving some of what is, is grown during this, the, the, you know, this season of plenty so that we have enough to eat and can distribute it accordingly during the seven years of famine. And so Pharaoh says, that's not a bad idea at all. I'm putting you in charge of that. And so somehow he finds himself from a position of zero influence and he finds himself in a position of like great and amazing influence. Like put in charge of really everything and everything was kind of in his hands. And so sure enough, that's what begins to happen. And this first, these first seven years of plenty begin. And he does a masterful job of, of creating some reserves and builds these storehouses and fills them with grain. And so it's a wonderful season. And then things turn around and say, at the end of those seven years, this famine hits. And sure enough, and everybody felt it especially all throughout Egypt. And so they began pouring in uh, into Pharaoh's gates and wanting, hey, we need food. What do we do? I can't believe this. And sure enough, the Pharaoh himself, he says, well, all the people came to him for food, but Pharaoh just turned around and said, go to Joseph. Go, go to Joseph. Go to the non-Egyptian, okay, the Hebrew uh, former slave slash imprisoned person, go to him and, and let him tell you what to do. And you just do what he tells you to do. I mean, it's kind of like, what in the world? I mean, that's so crazy. But then word gets out beyond the borders of Egypt that eat the Egyptians, somehow they've got extra food still. And so people start pouring in from everywhere. Well, here, here's where we pick up the story because now Jacob, who is Joseph's father, finds out about this. He finds out that there was grain in Egypt. And so he says to his sons, what are you guys doing just kind of looking at each other? Which is basically our question. What are you waiting for, guys? Don't you know that it appears that God is still at work? There's a great famine. Everybody's without food within, you know, any kind of distance around us. It looks really bad. It seems like it's a worldwide famine. And, and yet the Egyptians have food. God must be at work. And so what are you waiting for? Why are you just standing around looking at each other? I've heard that there's grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die, because that's a preference. That's a good idea, guys. Why don't you go try to buy some of this? I mean, th th this could be good for us. Well, sure enough, 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to buy grain. And then here's what we find out. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land. He was in charge of all of this, the person who sold the grain to all its people. Well, I knew that, so when, but his brothers didn't. Well, when Joseph's brothers arrived, they didn't recognize him. They bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. And he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him. And he, but, but instead of revealing himself at this point, he pretends to be a stranger. And he even speaks to them using an interpreter. He speaks to them in this Egyptian language. 
using an interpreter. And again, this, you know, they, they, they remember him, you know, as this 17 year old kid looking up to them from like a, a cistern from a well that they had thrown him in. I mean, this is, that's what they remember. And yet here's this governor over Egypt speaking Egyptian, speaking their language. And so there was no way that we're going to, I mean, he was close to 40 years old at this point. Why would they recognize him? And yet he sees them immediately and knows who they are. And so, of course, it's like, well, what would they do? I mean, what would you do? What do you think Joseph would do? I mean, why? I mean, here's the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean, this is what he's been waiting for all his life. It's like, oh my goodness, since I was 17 for the last 23 plus years, this is the moment I've been waiting for. I'm in power. I'm in a position of power. I now have influence. I, I, I am in a position and I now have an opportunity that has been presented to me where I can do something about the pain that was inflicted on me. I can hurt these guys. And matter of fact, there's no recourse. I can do it one at a time. And everybody can know about it. They can all watch. I can pick and choose exactly how I want to do it. I can go in order if I'd like. I can scramble it up. I'd like to, you know, let's start with the oldest. Let's go, Reuben. And I, I can do what I want. And yet, for some reason, he chooses a different path. But isn't it true that all of us At some point in our lives, we'll find ourselves in a situation like this. And it's all going to look different. And maybe it hasn't happened yet. But we'll find ourselves where we're in a position of power. And there's an opportunity to sort of get payback over somebody who has done something to us. I mean, it just tends to work this way. Isn't it true that life tends to work this way? That the people who hurt you the most will eventually need you. It just see, it, you know, it's not always the case, but it just seems like this happens a lot. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe for some of you, it was something that happened to you in your childhood. Maybe it was your parents and they abandoned you or maybe your parents, they hurt you somehow and they, they, they cause pain, but now they're older and they need you and they've come to you and, 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 and you're thinking, are you kidding me? Have you forgotten about all those years and all the pain? that I experienced. Maybe it was, um, for some of you, maybe it was just a sibling, you know, a brother or a sister who was, you know, they, they just kind of had it all together. They seemed, everything seemed to work out for them. And, you know, they had, you know, they were the smartest, they were the fastest, they were the coolest, they were the prettiest, they were the cutest, whatever. And it seemed to work out, but then they got older and you got older and your financial situation worked out and theirs didn't. And now they need you. And you're in this position. You find yourself in this, with this opportunity. Or, or maybe, maybe it was a, a, an ugly divorce, just kind of a nasty, gross divorce, and there was a custody battle and whatever it was. And there's just like you can't even look at each other or talk to each other. And you know, there's just too much pain and bitterness and anger. And both of you are kind of holding on to it. And you find yourself all of a sudden where they need you in, in some way, in some form or fashion. You're thinking, you know, here's my opportunity. Maybe it's more subtle. Maybe it's just somebody hurt you in your past, and now you have found yourself in a position of power and influence, and and you just want to get payback on some, somebody's got to pay. It doesn't have to be that person, but now you're you're actually causing hurt and pain in other people's lives just because well somebody's got to pay, and you don't you don't state it that way. You're not you're not intentionally thinking that way, but, but it is how you've begun to, it, it's become the lens that, that, that you see things through a little bit. And, and it's caused you some, some pain and some discomfort. And, and what is that in us? You know, what, what is that? And I think, because you know, this is true. I and mean, you've probably heard it said in some, in some way like this, that hurt people have a tendency to hurt other people. I mean, I've heard that all my life, but, but Maybe that applies to all of us because we've all been hurt by somebody we, and, and we have a tendency to lean in this direction. This is the knee-jerk reaction. I mean, this is kind of what we want to do. And yet as Christians, as Christians, for those who believe, well, but, but God is with me. He was with me in the worst when things were terrible. And, and, but I also believe that he's with me now in, in the position that I'm in and with this opportunity that I see in front of me. And if he's still with me, well, then what should I do? I mean, this is the question I think we have to learn how to ask as Christians. This is a tough one. What should I do as someone who is confident that God is with me in this position? 
in, in this place. And I'll tell you what Joseph did. Joseph found himself in this situation. His brothers have presented themselves to him. They don't know who he is. He knows who they are. And so he takes those jokers, he accuses them of being spies, and he throws them into prison for three days. And we're all like, mm-hmm, come on. Let's just get started. We're just getting warmed up, baby. I mean, that's, I mean, when we're watching movies, that's how we feel, right? I remember, and this is just, okay, this was off the cuff. I apologize. I remember um, my mother, see, I get the, I, this was my mom, okay? And did, was anybody, is anybody old enough to remember watching Rocky in the theaters? Oh, yeah, we got some old people in here. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you, Rigby's. <laughs> So she remembers, you know, because it was like, it's just, you know, so he's getting pummeled like the whole movie. And then finally, it's like at the very end and things start to turn around. And she remembers standing up and go Rocky, you know, it's like, you know, because you're bloodying up this other guy. And there's just something in us that causes us to, to get excited when somebody who just, they deserve it. They absolutely deserve something. And, and we... We're all about that, and we get excited about that. And what, you know, what is that in us? And yet Joseph finds himself in this situation, and, and he's tempted. He puts him in jail for a few days. He brings him back out, and, and then he, you know, they're insisting we're not spies. And so he says, okay, well, you, you've just told me, because he finds out that he has another brother that he didn't know about, and it's actually his, a full-blooded brother. It's because he was the only son of Rachel at the time who was you know, one of his four, the, the four women that Jacob had, had uh, kids with. And now he's, he finds out that there's another one, Benjamin, who's younger than him, that's one of uh, Rachel's sons. And he's like, so, so here's what I, I'll make a deal with you. If you go back home, I'm going to keep Simeon here with me. I'm going to put him in jail. I need you to go back home and I need you to bring Benjamin back here because I want to meet this guy. And they're like, no way, we can't do that. He's just... He said, that's the way it's going to be. And so then they, they buy the grain. And so he, he gives them the grain, Joseph does. And then he, he orders that all of their money be put back into the sacks without them knowing. And so then they leave town and they get, you know, they, they go in a, a day's journey away and they camp out that night and they open their bags and they realize that the money's still there. And they're like, what's going on? How did this happen? They're scared. They don't know, you know, is he trying to, to get us killed? You know, what, what's happening? And so they end up making it back home and they tell Jacob everything that, uh, everything that happened. And they tell him, look, we, we met, you know, the governor of the land and the guy that was in charge of everything. And he, he sold us some grain for our family. But at the same time, he told us that we had to come back with our youngest brother, Benjamin, that, you know, for what, for some reason, and he kept Simeon there. And yet Jacob, of course, does what? He refuses. No way. I, I would rather starve to death than to lose yet another son like I lost Joseph. And he refuses. And, and they, they're just convinced that this is the only way they're going to get to go back. And yet he doesn't allow it. Some time passes. They run out of grain again. And so now it's like, well, so... Dad, we've got to go back. And the, the only way that he's going to see us again is if we have Benjamin with us. And he's like, no way. Judah finally steps in and says, I'm just telling you, I swear on my own life that if anything happens to Benjamin, if I don't bring him back safely, then, then I'll take his place and I'll, I'll die for, on his behalf. And so he, he finally agrees and they leave and they go back. And they present themselves to Joseph with Benjamin. And, and then he's, he, he, at this point, he takes them, he invites them into his own home for a meal. And he sits them all day, which, of course, they, they, they're skeptical. You know, what's happening here? Are we fattening the pig before you slaughter us? Like, what is happening? We don't understand why this is happening. Is it just because we're foreigners? Is it because we're shepherds? But he, he ends up feeding them this meal, and he puts them in... In, uh, in, in order of their age, which they couldn't figure out how he did that. And then he gives a greater portions, five times the amount of food to Benjamin. And then he and the Egyptians, he still plays like he doesn't know anything. He and the Egyptians eat in a different room because they, you know, they wouldn't, wouldn't dare eat with these filthy Hebrew shepherds. And so, so this happens. They eat some food together. And then uh, he, he tells them, okay, so um, here's what I'm going to do. 
I'll give you your grain back, you know, great, you can go back home. Thanks for bringing him. And so they end up leaving, but this time with uh, all the grain, and, and sure enough, he puts the money back in, he puts their, the, the silver back in their, their grain bags again, and then even proceeds to put his own silver goblet in Benjamin's bag, and they leave again. And they, they, they don't even make it out of the city, and he sends people to arrest them. It's like, what is he doing here? You know, why is he manipulating this? And I just wonder kind of what's going on. It's kind of like, a, it's like, I, I want to make sure that there's remorse, that there's you know, what, what's happening? I mean, who knows what's going on? But he brings them back and accuses them, you know, that, that they've stolen from them. And no, that, that hasn't happened. And sure enough, they find this silver goblet of his in Benjamin's bag. And Judah just loses it. And he's like, oh my goodness, if we don't all go back home, Jacob, our father, is going to die. And he, they, they literally throw themselves on the floor begging for mercy. And instead, in that moment, Joseph breaks down and he's like, okay, I, I've had enough. I can't do this anymore. I am Joseph. And it's this, this big reveal. Is my father still living? To which, I, you know, in this moment, it's like, oh, you're Joseph. And so they figured it out. No, I'm sure they're like, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? What do you mean you're Joseph? But his brothers, were not, they weren't even able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Oh my goodness, is this real? But Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Oh, that one. <laughs> like there was a different brother, Joseph, at some point. No, it's like, oh, that one. Are you serious? Oh, so you really are him. We didn't recognize you. We didn't know that's who you were. And all of a sudden, they're terrified because they realize that Joseph is in a position of power. And, and, you know, they haven't forgotten everything that they've done and all the pain and the hurt that they've inflicted on Joseph. And so they, they know, like, this is the moment. Like, you are in a position where you could do whatever you want with us. And they're begging for mercy. And Joseph is just, like, listen to how he responds. He says, don't be distressed. Don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Now, this one's going to just, if you've never read this before, this one should just shatter your theology. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Hold up. God didn't send Joseph. His brothers did. I read the story. I mean, I remember, uh, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's just not the case. Like, they sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. Like, this is, a, this is a terrible, horrible, yucky, disgusting situation. Like, this is a, you know, like a 48 hours. This is a snapped. I mean, this is just not a good situation. This is like a TV show. And, and you're telling me now that Joseph's perspective, Joseph's perspective, because, I mean, he, he had the same facts. Matter of fact, he had all the feelings and the emotions and the pain that went along with it. In the memories, and yet he chose to see this through a different lens. No, no, no. God has engineered this somehow through man's depravity, through your bad decisions, through your choices. God has, set, has somehow engineered this to, to allow me to be in this position to be able to serve you in this moment. And I just see it that way. It's like, what? Are you kidding me? How in the world could you think that way? And yet he continues. So then it was not you who sent me here. I'm just telling you yet. I mean, you got to remember every time when you read through this story, um, this part of the story, you see that like over and over, it's recorded that Joseph would weep, that he would cry, that he would run off and just burst into tears, cry so loudly that the Egyptians heard him crying. Like, that, that, that's the way that the story talks about it, because I, I think there's so much emotion still attached to this for Joseph. It's not like it's just, oh, I've, I can't even remember. I did a little hypnosis thing and there were some, some incense and some herbal things and some acupuncture and I really forgot about everything. And so I don't even have those memories. And so I'm just, that's not what's happening. Joseph is choosing in spite of the hurt and the pain and the memories and all, even though it caused great emotion. And I think there was a lot of that connected to why he would he would turn around and cry. Instead, he's choosing to see this through a different lens. It wasn't you who sent me here, but God. 
it was God. I, I just know it. I never saw it until like this moment. For the last 23 years, I did not see this coming. I didn't know what all of this was for. I didn't know what the purpose was. I didn't know why this happened to me. I didn't know why I had to experience that. I didn't know why I had, I've, I've got so much emotion and pain and trauma, so much relational baggage, if you will. But, but God, I believe that he was always with me. And so guess what? I still believe that he's with me even now. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall, watch this. Not just, you know what? Go about your merry way. I'm not going to kill you. I've had a little mercy. I've had a little moment. Now, it's, he takes it so much further. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, and your grandchildren, your flocks and your herds, everything, bring it all. I will provide for you there. <laughs> because five years of famine are still to come, and I want to protect you. It's like, what? I mean, what? It, it's, I mean, who responds that way? Who would dare respond that way? Well, well, you're just reading the Bible, you know? So like it's... They're recording what happened because you wouldn't write this if you wanted people to believe it and you're making it up. It's like I'm making this up and so and I really want people to believe my story. Okay, well then don't write it this way because nobody's buying it. That's one of the reasons I love reading through Scripture and seeing things like this. And I'm like, so th this had to be true because who would make that up? Oh yeah, I'm just gonna I just I'm gonna show you this incredible mercy. I'm gonna show you great mercy and I'm gonna. I still hurt and I still weep because I remember these things and I know who you little punks are and I kind of want to just, you know, you know, throw some blows. I want to knock you out a little bit and then maybe dust you off. And I, Instead, I'm, I'm going to send you back home. I just want you to bring it all back here and I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you over these next because I'm in a position to do that. I'm in a position to go either direction, but I'm choosing to go in this direction, the one where I trust that God is with me even now. And so sure enough, everybody comes and he begins to provide for them and take care of them and feed them during this season and years pass. And all the while, the brothers are still a little concerned. It's like, uh-oh, um, I'm not sure that this is really what it's about. I think Joseph, what if he holds a grudge against us? What if really he, he's just kind of playing the long game? It's like the long con here. And really, when our father dies, he's, he's just treating us well right now out of respect and honor for his dad. And really, when something happens to him, when Jacob dies, then he, it's going to be like, it's on. And it's not going to be good for us. Because that's what, that's what we consider. And why would anybody do otherwise? Well, because this is what people do. That is how people in power respond when they are confident that God is with them. What? Well, I just don't understand why he would do otherwise. He must just be kind of waiting on, Jay, on our dad to die. No, this is how people in power respond when they are really confident that God is with them. And that's who Joseph was. And sure enough, when Joseph's brother, one day Jacob passes, and there's a whole, there's several chapters all about that, but when, Jake, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, uh-uh. What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs that we did to him? And so they, either this was true or they come up with this little plan to maybe try to sway Joseph in their direction. So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father, hey, dad, you know, he, he gave us some instructions. He didn't tell you, but he gave us some instructions before he died. Uh, and this is what you're. This is what you're to say. This is and this. This is supposedly Jacob's words. This is what you're to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly, because I know about those things. And so then they beg. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when their message came to him, Joseph wept again. 
It's like in this moment, it's like you're, you're begging for forgiveness. And it just conjures all that pain and all those memories back up again. It's like, oh my goodness. Because now they, they come to him. His brothers came to him and they threw themselves down before him and said, we are your slaves. And he's crying and he's in tears and he's like, oh my goodness. Like there's something in me that really wants to use my position and my power to get back. To seek some vengeance on my own. To, to pay back what you guys deserve. And yet in that moment, wipes his eyes, I imagine. He says to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? What a different perspective. It's like, no, no, no. I, I'm not going to play God here. I'm in a position of power and influence. I, and I'm choosing to allow God to be God. I'm not going to play God here. You intended to harm me. God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. I promise to do so. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. What? Who does that? I mean, I mean seriously. Well, only, only someone who has found themselves with this opportunity where they're in a position of power, but they are still confident that God is really with them, even in that moment. That's somebody who responds this way. And so let me tell you, let, let's talk about then, let's land the plane. How does this, what does this mean for you and me? How are we to answer the question? I mean, because I know, I guarantee you, every single one of us have a scenario, a circumstance that we're thinking of right now either one that we're in currently or one that has happened in the past, either to us or people we love. And there's a lot of hurt and there's a lot of pain associated with that. And it's not pretty. So we'll start at the top here. The basic question again. So what are you waiting for? Can, can I just ask you that? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a little vengeance? Are you waiting for the moment? To be in a position to be able to pay somebody back or a group of people or that church or that pastor or, you know, maybe it's just a politician or maybe it's an ex or a loved one or a former friend or group or whatever it is. What are you waiting for? Are you hoping to find yourself with an opportunity to pay back? I mean, do you find yourself thinking about those things, considering scenarios? I've been there. So been there. You fall asleep at night and you realize you're thinking just some really horrible thoughts. And you're like, what in the world? What is that in me? I just imagine running over them and then backing up. <laughs> Anybody? I mean, we're just like, we're, I mean, we can be real. We're human. That's the knee jerk reaction. That's the, the, the brokenness and the depravity within ourselves. Do you find yourself telling your side of the story in order to just get people to sympathize with you? Is that the way you talk about it? It's, it's even a tough question just to even consider. But let me, let me just say this. The only way, the only way, and it, this doesn't make it easy, but, but this is true. The only way you will ever see the good that God can do with your situation in all of the bad. The only way that you're going to see that is if you're able to do this. To first be willing to acknowledge that God was with you in the bad. That's number one. But then refuse to play God when things are good. That's hard. But just imagine what, what a difference that would make. What, what, would that, what would that do for you? How, how would you begin to accept I me? Mean, what, what would it change about your perspective? What would it change about your current relationships, your current situation, the, the position you find yourself in, whatever it is, whatever the circumstances to know if here's what I know. I, I know that it is very difficult 
to live this way. It is very difficult to live really confident that God is with you when things are bad, when they're not going well. It's hard. But it is so much more difficult to live as if God is really with you when you find yourself in a position of power. I promise it is so much more difficult then because now there's opportunity. And they can't do anything about it. And that feels so much better than the alternative. And yet the truth is, and you know this is true, we have all, when it comes to our Heavenly Father, we have all sinned against Him. All of us. Like from the get-go, daily, like even now, when those thoughts enter our minds. and It's like, nope, not only forward and backward, now I'm going to go forward again. You know, I'm going to leave tire tracks this time. And then I'm going to turn the car around. You know, that... It's like that, that we even conjure those thoughts. It's like, okay, so this is not, that's not of God. We've sinned against God, and yet the God of the universe, who has every right and every bit of authority and power to give us what we deserve, chose not to. But instead, in the backdrop of all of our stories and all of our circumstances is a cross where our Savior hung. And died for you and me and gave us something we didn't deserve his pardon his forgiveness and so we have a choice we have a choice to make I mean when it comes to those people in our past or in our future or in our present we have a choice to make we can either we can either look back or look up. It's that simple. We can either look back or look up. We can look back at the pain and remember the hurts and the struggles and the trial. We can remember that. It doesn't go anywhere, but we can, by looking back, it just means where are we focusing? Where are we, you know, turning to? What are we leaning on? Where are we spending our thoughts and our time? We can, we can do that or in the moment, not forget, but in the moment, we can choose to look up. We can look a different way. We can choose to say, but I know that God is with me, even now. He wasn't just with me when things were really bad and when it was all happening. Okay, God, you, you are with me and you're going to sustain me and you're going you're gonna to see me through this. You're going to give me the strength. God, would you give me the strength? That, like that, That's how we pray. And we expect God to be with us. But then in the moment when things do turn around and we find ourselves in a position where we, could, where we have an opportunity, we could do something about this, about the pain that has been inflicted on us, in that moment, it is so much harder to say, and God, I know that you're with me now. Heavenly Father, I just trust that you are with me now. And yet, we can choose. We can choose to look up and say, but even in this moment, I'm, when I have power, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to choose not not to try to play God, but instead just to trust God. Just Im imagine. Because I'm not, I, I can't stand here today and say, you see how easy it is? Like, this is so easy. You could go do, it. I'm just saying imagine if. What a difference it might make in your life and the lives of the people around you. What kind of difference would that make? Because I honestly believe that your heavenly father has given us no other option because his son gave his life for us, gave us what we didn't deserve, absolutely didn't deserve, we don't deserve, and we'll never deserve it. He has given us his son, and he's given us his forgiveness. And so he's looking at you and me today, and he's saying, what are you waiting for? Forgive them. I forgave you. Forgive them. Forgive them. Not for their sake. For yours. I forgave you. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're watching online, if you're in the room today, and maybe you've never received that gift, the gift of forgiveness... I just, can I give you an opportunity to receive that today? That may be your starting place. It's like you can't imagine offering forgiveness, maybe because you've never realized that you've been so forgiven. 
And I'm just going to ask that you receive that today as your first step. And if you would, you can just pray right where you are. This is, this is <laughs> prayers don't save you. They don't fix you. Prayers are simply a statement of declaration. It's just declaring that, hey, I am putting my trust somewhere else other than myself. And that's what can begin today in your heart. So right where you are, right where you are, if you would just pray something like this along with me, just say, Heavenly Father, I want to give you my life. I want to give you my life because you've given me what I don't deserve. And I see that now. You've given me forgiveness. And you've done it in the form of a Savior. And his, I believe his name is Jesus. And so I'm putting my, I'm transferring my trust from myself to you. I'm just asking that you would change me. That you would replace the old with something new. Something better. And teach me to live according to your spirit. I want to be led by you. I give you my life. I give you my all. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.